how would this lesbian masturbating scene rank in your top five favourite lesbian masturbating scenes in cinema? I would give it... Hello there. Hello there. I'll try it again. Hello there and welcome to our latest episode of Obscurama. I'm your host, Laurie Brewster, a horror filmmaker with many titles under my belt. With me today is Megan Trimethic, who has many cups of coffee that she has attempted very hard to, to make, not quite under her belt. I spit in his coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Megan is also an aspiring uh, filmmaker as well. So, we are discussing a very controversial feature film today called The Sentinel, the 1977 occult horror thriller directed by British, or should I say English, director Michael Winner. We are discussing the film, but we are both fans, I think, of The Sentinel. We both enjoyed it. Yeah, I totally enjoyed it. So, in many respects, our discussion today, I, I guess, is a sort of defence mounted in favour of the film. But yeah. why, why is The Sentinel a film that is still, even today, mired in some controversy? Well, for those of you who haven't seen The Sentinel, you should go and watch it because it is a thriller and it has twists and revelations that you don't want to spoil. But I'm assuming, as I would with anyone that has some common sense, that you're watching one of these videos because you have in fact already seen the film about yeah. to be discussed. Get your own opinion first, guys. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Nick. <Megan>. So, <laughs> so the Sentinel follows a, a young model who finds herself the beneficiary of a very unlikely uh, New York apartment rental deal that sees her staying in some luxury accommodation. Unbeknownst to her though is that she may in fact be subject to an occult conspiracy, one that involves her neighbours who are themselves very peculiar characters. In addition to this, she has a fiancé whose motives are not entirely in her favour. This culminates in an exciting and controversial finale where hell itself unleashes itself in the apartment building with a cast that includes folks with physical disfigurements. Other controversies arise from the residents of the apartment building, in particular the, car <laughs> the, the characters of a lesbian couple and what may be considered a dated form of representation, you know for all you sensitive audience members. <laughs> so, so uh, this explains why the film is at 50% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is a terrible website, which is only used by idiots, really. But still, let's, let's, <laughs> let's use this statistic for sake of argument. And is one that proves divisive even today among horror fans. So we have quite a lot to discuss with The Sentinel. Mm -hmm. um, and again, The Sentinel, directed by English director Michael Winner. Controversial director, period. Uh, not only for The Sentinel, but also for Death Wish, starring mm -hmm. Charles Bronson. And the perception that such a film had pro-vigilante, kind of right-wing sentiments. So, we come to The Sentinel. Well, first of all, as with any film, as a as a young 23-year-old nymph. <laughs> what did it feel like watching a film? Watching a film? <laughs> this is my first film. Um, well, anyway, I really enjoyed The Sentinel. I thought, I really liked how twisty it was. Um, and I think that was my favorite thing about the film. I used Definitely. to be twisty when I was younger. Um, Alas, no more. <laughs> Yeah, um, I thought the acting was really good. Burgess Meredith, which he has a great name, um, but he was also just a kind of standout performer, in my opinion, and his character was just amazingly written. And yeah. Okay, so, so right, so you have um, 
So you enjoyed the performances. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy the story? Yeah, I really enjoyed the plot. Did you find it uh, scary or, or atmospheric? Or? Um, I definitely found it scary and for sure atmospheric. Um, I think it's a really interesting idea, the kind of, well, one of the twists, because I feel like there were many and twists And you can disclose the film. twists, so yeah. it's, well, you know, um, spoilers are okay, folks. Well, the fact that it's this kind of occult prophecy of someone is the sentinel and they have to kind of watch over heaven. I think, I think that, uh, hell, sorry. I think that's a really interesting idea. Um, and it, it, I just, I felt so sorry for the protagonist though, didn't you? Like, right. having to have this fate, because at, at the end, she becomes the new sentinel. Um, but I think that's the most interesting part really, is it's a really bittersweet ending, because most people might think it's a good ending, it's morally a good ending, but it's a really tragic ending. So, which part did you find the most entertaining? Um, ooh, for different reasons. I think the ending was really climactic. The and last act. Yeah, the last act, for sure. Um, I think it had a really, a really nice build up and really strong visuals. Um, obviously, that's a very controversial part of the film. Um, also, for more eerie and comedic reasons I really liked um, Burgess Meredith's character when he's first introduced and he first comes in to the apartment to meet the protagonist. I thought that was just a really entertaining and kind of eccentric funny scene as well. The film evokes some comparisons to Rosemary's Baby, the Roman Polanski film, especially mm -hmm. with its own cast of uh, peculiar residents in, in a kind of satanic apartment building. Yeah, no I could definitely see the similarities, for sure. Rosemary's Baby is considered a classic in cinema, not even within the horror genre. Roman Polanski is an obviously controversial filmmaker in his own right. Um, the Sentinel, in my opinion, isn't a film that is necessarily a work of serious cinematic achievement in the same way we might consider something like Rosemary's Baby or you know, The Exorcist. It's, for me, what I enjoy about The Sentinel is its pulpy horror aspect. Mm -hmm. It's something that evokes the horror or even the trashy horror paperbacks of the 1970s and the 1980s. Those books whose covers are celebrated in the book Paperbacks from Hell by uh, Grady Hendrix. And I think for horror fans that have a sense of humour and an affection for the genre, that don't place their value on films entirely on the prestige or the perceived coolness. Uh, I'm thinking of A24 in this respect, where you're allowed to have a film that is very rough around the edges, then The Sentinel, I think, delivers in that department. Mm, it, yeah. it feels like a, a crazy paperback, and of course it was. It totally does, for sure. And yeah, you're saying it is a novel, isn't it? Yes, yeah. uh, written by John Convict. Um, I'll double check that name in a <laughs> trivia section of the video, but yes. And um, the sequel to The Sentinel was The Guardian, and eventually these books became more and more fantastical, taking an almost science fiction edge, where they were ended up with um, Sentinel characters in different universes even, all wow. working together to protect mankind from the forces of hell. So let's talk about the cast, because there is a large cast in The Sentinel. Producers at Universal took inspiration from the success of the comedy Airplane, which starred Leslie Nielsen, and comprised of a large cast of once famous hot actors who were now in their twilight years. And so we have quite a lot of uh, well-known names, but to say past their prime sounds so cruel, but that, that was how it was considered. Mm -hmm. um, we have our star, Christina Raines. Mm -hmm. uh, the main star is actually Chris Sarandon, who um, had received the nomination for Best Supporting Actor only two years before. And there are plenty of other actors with Oscar nominations from years previous as well. And 
we'll be able to discuss some of those, but Burgess Meredith is, is, is an obvious one. Mm -hmm. You also have, <laughs> it's like a who's who. There's Ava Gardner. Yeah. There's, um, oh, I'm trying to remember her name. Sylvia, Sylvia, we'll, 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 we'll get to uh, that. <laughs> Um, Sorry, Sylvia. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll get to you. There is um, also actors who are just, I mean, there's Eli Wallach mm -hmm. from The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Unrecognisable. Don't new. you agree? <laughs> it's just true. Mm -hmm. Eli Wallach looks nothing like he would do from The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, <laughs> um, playing a, a, a New York police detective with a very handsome tie. And there's also um, Christopher Walken as well in, in, a, in a new part. Dom, Tom Perringer uh, has a cameo at mm -hmm. the end. Jeff Goldblum um, mentioned has a few lines in the film as well. Mm -hmm. And Beverly D'Angelo, um, who you might know from National Lampoon as the mother of the family, this was her film debut. And, and the, the list kind of goes on. Mm -hmm. But there's three actors, I think, that all have had Oscar nominations for Best Actress and, and Best Actor. In, wow. in the cast. And that supporting actress nominee being Sylvia Miles and veteran actor John Carradine plays the Sentinel before mm -hmm. uh, Christina Raines, the lead in the Sentinel, will assume his place. Mm -hmm. um, grandfather of uh, David Carradine, I think, or sorry, should I say father of David Carradine from the TV series Kung Fu or from the Tarantino Kill Bill movies. So we have, um, we have a wide and epic cast. What did you think of Chris Sarandon, known to most horror fans as the vampire in Fright Night? Mm -hmm. I thought he was great, actually. I loved his portrayal because it was very mixed. He played quite a nice, likeable, charismatic character. I feel like I say charismatic in every video, but he was. Um, but then there were also these undertones coming out of like, oh, is he not to be trusted? Um, and that was, yeah, one of my favourite twists. It's like, oh, you think maybe he's not to be trusted, then you think he definitely is to be trusted, and then it flips back to be like, no, he's not to be trusted at all. And I think that was great. His performance really helped. Yeah, he did play a really charismatic, charming uh, performance mm -hmm. that when it slips into um, uh, villainy is, is unexpected and, and effective. Um, there's something of the bluebeard about him. Yeah. We learn that he may in fact have murdered his previous wives and the film does go to efforts to throw our, our loyalties for and against him. And um, interestingly, uh, producers who had fought for his casting against the, the wishes of Michael Winner, who in fact wanted Martin Sheen from Apocalypse Now to play that role, um, insisted on Chris Sarandon and <laughs> didn't recognise him once they started receiving rushes and claimed why uh, this Greek waiter was now playing a starring role in the film. Such was his uh, unexpected appearance to them. I think he looks fantastic. And yeah. uh, Chris Sarandon was something of a heartthrob before, ladies. Yeah, uh, I'm not in, surprised. In the 70s and 80s. Christina Rain's performance. Now, I'm a little mixed on her. I thought she mm -hmm. did okay, but there were, but at times I often considered her to be wooden and stiff. Mm -hmm. um, she is someone that reputedly had a terrible time on set and was frequently um, in, in clashes with Michael Winner and who reportedly has never in fact watched the film she starred in. Oh wow. What did you think of uh, Christina Reyes? Um, I think I'm kind of mixed as well because I found myself really liking her character so I think I might be a little biased to like, oh, she's a really independent female character um, that wants to live on her own and is kind of making these decisions. So I think that might be masking that maybe, yeah, she, she was a little, a little wooden. Um, yeah, but I think she had really good drama moments at the same time, like particularly at the end um, when she's having her breakdown, I think it was a good performance. Sure. We also have uh, Rose Burgess Meredith as well, and he is, I think, always fantastic. His performance is not entirely um, unlike his characterization in Burnt Offerings as well, the great um, Alfred Reed horror film as well. He 
is a very experienced, charismatic actor, himself Oscar nominee and veteran of over 60 years. So you kind of expect a good performance whenever you see Burgess. Mm -hmm. um, but I think he steals the show somewhat. Yeah, I agree. He definitely delivered. I haven't seen Burnt Offerings, but I need to watch it because I'm a fan. So you're a Burgess Meredith fan. Yep. Um, <laughs> Sylvia Miles, in her smaller supporting role as the one of the two lesbians, as they are referred to in, in the film, uh, with uh, Beverly D'Angelo, who doesn't have any lines. Um, but uh, w what did you think of them? I, th I, th I thought Sylvia had quite, uh, quite a lot of presence in, in the, the short time she had in the film. Yeah. Sylvia is... The masturbating lesbian. The older lesbian. The older lesbian. Okay. Beverly D'Angelo is the masturbating ah, sorry, lesbian. Sorry, so sorry. Um, I thought as a pair they were both great. And yeah, I think um, Sylvia had a kind of very dominating presence and I liked that. How would this lesbian masturbating scene rank in your top five favourite lesbian masturbating scenes in cinema? I would give it... So would it be, it would be ranked third yeah. in your top five? Yeah. After what? Oh, that is a mystery, <laughs> my friends. Maybe we can unearth the rest of them if you keep watching these If videos. you would like uh, to see Megan Trometic's <laughs> top five lesbian masturbating uh, scenes in cinema, channel Hex video, then let us know in the comments uh, below. Yeah, um, John Cardi doesn't have much to say. Like Beverly D'Angelo, um, these are mute characters. Um, Beverly has some, uh, has some great screen presence. Yeah, great, uh, great physical actor. Magnificent breasts, you know, that has to be <laughs> stated as well. But so does Sylvia Miles, and we see them often in the sense Yeah, we do. We do. They're very good. <laughs> top, top rated. <laughs> um, we also have... The f uh, Eli Wallach, or Wallach, um, as I did not recognise him as the Caucasian police detective. Mm -mm. You know, he was un unrecognisable, um, but he was quite charismatic and, and funny. You know, I'd yeah, he totally was. It just shows what a good character actor he is. Yes, clearly, ab absolutely. Yeah. Christopher Walken, um, it took some time before he was allowed to speak. Yeah, <laughs> I've almost wondered if. Um, if he would have any lines at all, you, know, you always see him with Eli just kind of nodding, <laughs> like, yeah. 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 But even in such a small part early in his career, you could tell he had presence. Mm. You know, a very distinct look about him. He has a great look, yeah. Very mm -hmm. unusual. That's the same for Jeff Goldblum as well, who yeah. dubbed over his lines. They weren't recorded then and there, so he was entirely mm -hmm. ADR'd, as we see in the biz. Oh, wow. I actually didn't notice it was all ADR. Um, Tom Berenger from Platoon and many other films <laughs> has a three second cameo as one of the new uh, married couples coming to, to check out a property at the end, mm -hmm. you know, where Christina Raines is now the, the new sentinel. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the main cast that come to mind, but there's Ava Gardner as well, we shouldn't forget as well. Yeah. Um, she's a celebrated um, actress, her heyday being the 1950s and 60s. She had appeared uh, in the blockbuster Earthquake with uh, Steve McQueen only a few years before. Um, I thought she was great. I thought she had... Uh, and you can really tell the power of those veteran actors when they have supporting roles where they can deliver just a few lines but they're so full-bodied. Definitely. With character and Full of personality. personality. Yeah. yeah. No, for sure. I particularly liked Ava Gardner, actually, because I think her first scene um, when she's with, yeah, the protagonist, she comes across very kind of cold and kind of bitchy, but in a subtle way. But it's it's an intimidating bitchiness, and that's awesome. Um, but then she develops a warmth, but then it can turn like that um, in a kind of manipulative um, manipulative way. And yeah, I thought that was great. Um, there's also the cat as well. Yes, it's quite magnificent. What was the cat's name again? Jezebel. Jezebel. Yes, Jezebel. Oh, Jezebel Jezebel's was cute. <laughs> Jezebel's birthday party scene is, is something quite extraordinary. The first time I've seen yeah. a satanic cat birthday party. Hopefully not the last. With guests entirely comprised of deceased serial killers and, yeah. and murderers. 
and the revelation of which, when we learn that they're dead, I think it's, it's quite good. They mm. could have made more of it in the film. They could have built up that twist. Yeah. Because it's quite shocking. It kind of it is. It's revealed a little matter of fact. Yeah, you know, but it was a bit. But it's still very cool, though, to yeah. consider that the building was empty all along. Yeah, and they did sow their seeds, which was great, like mm -hmm. with the black and white photograph, like, why is it in black and white? Oh, it's because, you know... He's a ghost. It's a time has passed. Oh, yes, I, I, could, I could imagine that for a young person, a black and white photograph <coughs> might, might feel like something recovered from an archaeological dig. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, it was a hipster choice. <laughs> it was a hipster choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the in critique of the film, uh, the I think for me the performances are fine. Um, Christina Raines, I think, was a bit wooden at times. But she also has some good stuff. Um, I'm not sure, actually, if the, if the film's critique in general is, is levelled much at the acting. I think it's seen as basically competent. Yeah. Um, you can let us know if you disagree in the comments. But I think that's the case. Um, where one could make some critique is in the editing of the film. And to me, it is more the structure upon which we learn where we experience the revelations of what's true and what's not. It can feel like it's a little all over the place. Mm -hmm. The flashbacks don't necessarily build towards a very effective, streamlined chronology that takes us to the finale, mm -hmm. you know, in a very straightforward way. Ultimately, we're going to learn that she will be the sentinel. Ultimately, we learn that it's the job of all these demons and, and ghosts to try and get her to kill herself before she can assume the role of the sentinel, that this is a game that has always been played with the chosen one. Mm -hmm. um, but we spend a lot of time in the subplots and her past and in a way, and the relationship, in a way that might not make it as effective as it could be at just getting us from A to B. I also think that the revelations we get are sometimes not timed very well. Like the revelations that the residents were already ghosts or dead happened almost midway. Yeah. And then it felt like there was a kind of lull in which she makes connections with the secret priestly order and all starts to learn that she might be the chosen one or that... Well, it kind of goes on to Chris Sarandon really taking the story forward actually yeah. at that point. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that worked quite as well. Yeah. It could have been edited better or written more structured. Mm -hmm. I guess, again, maybe I'm not seeing the connection here, but personally, I was a little bit confused with the massive emphasis, particularly at the beginning with her modeling career. Like, I don't know about you, but it, it's good that we're learning about the character, but it, it felt like, like, why is this super relevant to have so much emphasis on her doing photo shoot after photo shoot? That is more just just for me, I just was a little lost with that. Uh, I don't know about you. I personally didn't find that such an issue. Uh -huh. I think because that is her life. It is, And yeah. it's quite a fascinating aspect of the life to see. But yeah. I think it's also, it's there so that when you see her starting to deteriorate and crumble, mm -hmm. that she can, that we can see the perfect life she has fall apart. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise if we didn't see her at work and witness the breakdowns at work, yeah. she would only be sitting at home. True. Yeah, so those yeah no, it did show the breakdown really well. You're yeah, right. and also the modelling career shows a kind of perfect life which she is having to pretend. So she is always having mm. to pretend to be happy, drinking posh things or swishing her hair around you know, luxuriously and merrily when actually mm -hmm. she's someone that has tried to commit suicide after. Yeah. You know, so that's why it's there. Without, no, that's great, without yeah. it, it, it wouldn't work. No, fair. Um, I think for me... Um, I think the film was attempting to adapt too many narrative strands from the novel and it could have afforded to sacrifice some and concentrate more on others. But at the same time, part of the charm of a film that is not perfect by a long shot is the kind of wild, erratic, narrative, chronological and style elements. This is what makes a cult film, a B-movie, effectively. You know, if it was slick and sophisticated, we might not be talking about it. It might just be more forgettable. Yeah, it certainly wasn't forgettable. Um, the script was written by Michael Winner and John Colvin Ritz, and 
uh, the screenwriter considered Michael Winner to be too fixated on the gratuitous aspects of a script and not as much on the spiritual elements. Mm -hmm. um, one gets the impression that John perhaps saw a, a, a more grandiose value to his literary work than Michael Winner did. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, especially when his uh, um, sequels start taking place with cosmic kind of battles, you yeah. know, uh, with good versus evil. Michael Winner was more interested in lesbians and demons. Um, <laughs> um, Michael Lynn is a fascinating person, someone that, uh, who we mentioned is, has uh, something of a, a controversy about him. Um, but as a, as a filmmaker, certainly was quite outspoken in his opinions and tended to have quite strong disagreements um, with cast and crew. Mm -hmm. You know, there was drama in his films, it seems. Mm -hmm. In terms of the controversy then, mm -hmm. um, let's, um, let's just talk about the, the, the lesbians. Um, so in, in the novel, the residents speak of them disparagingly. Um, they think that they're kind of um, decadent. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we do learn that they are, in fact, both murderers um, and devils. <laughs> so, so then mm. perhaps not an actual representative of... <laughs> it's actually quite funny nowadays, whenever someone sees a character, they always consider mm. them a representative of their group identity. Yeah. You know, it's like one can't be a lesbian in a film without them being seen as a supposed representative of all lesbians and then the film is judged for how it's treating the subject of all lesbians. Yeah, um, I, I haven't understood that personally, like I, I've never understood why that is the case. Because mm. um, a character is going to be flawed in some way if it's a well-written character, it just so happens that these are antagonists. Sure, so. <laughs> it's like what group identity does Burgess Meredith represent, you know, you know Camp cute elderly men are all, in fact, <laughs> the devil. <laughs> it's like, that's it's such an ageist film as well as homophobic. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> exactly. And to be fair, you know, the male audience love the lesbians. And <laughs> they said, "No, I don't see oh. why it's supposed to be homophobic." You would say that. Yeah, we thought they were great. <laughs> yeah, lesbians, <laughs> more lesbians. Let's go for cinema. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, those th th those controversies were not as significant, though. Um, mm -hmm. They simmered. The real controversy was uh, in Michael Winner's decision to use or to cast, should I say, uh, people with physical disfigurements. Some of them with born disfigurements. Other ones, other folks who had obviously been the victim of accidents. And uh, it brings into mind. Uh, the film Freaks by Todd Browning from, I think, 1928, which met very similar controversy for the exact same thing. In that film, it follows a, a circus with a sideshow in which the entire cast is comprised of folks with um, disabilities and conditions that lend themselves to very strong visual depictions. Mm. Um, so, we have we have some interesting uh, points to discuss there. Yeah. Incidentally, during the filming, some of the unions, because um, you may know how much I love unions when it concerns the <laughs> film industry, some of the unions took offence at the casting of these folks, but they apparently took offence that their members, union members, were forced to dine with these folks and insisted that separate um, facilities were made available for them to have lunch and dinner so that they didn't mm. have to be sat with the folks that had those conditions and, wow. and disabilities. Um, in true Michael Winner fashion, he said um, as, a, as a matter of protest, he wanted to have lunch with them, but it was a very hot day <laughs> and they were eating outside. <laughs> So I couldn't do it, darling. It was it was just too hot, hot that day. But a perfectly temperate day, I would have made that protest. 
Um, so, <laughs> so that's quite extraordinary. Um, yeah. Now, at the time, I think the moral paternalism of most do-gooder uh, attitudes, particularly the kind of liberal attitudes of the day. So the folks that were cast in such roles as not really being able to properly consent to their own appearance in the film. That they, in other words, had to be looked after by people like them and prevented from being exploited for their bodies on a film which is quite a striking thing perhaps for many of you watching who might be actors because your physicality does tend to be <laughs> something that is exploited. You know, whether you have a physical disfigurement or a sweet hot ass, that or the other is going to be exploited for cinema because even in the most enlightened films, uh, such as those of H24, we might notice that lead actors of all sorts tend to be very pretty. You know, awfully pretty. Awfully pretty. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the discussion has evolved from that. That was the paternalism of that era, the mm -hmm. 70s, the 80s, you know, they, they have to be looked after, you know, to, you know, what right does anyone have not to? Um, you have the kind of uh, pop cultural ideas, you know, body pride and things like that, mm -hmm. you know, where... Um, which I think is quite quite right that no one should be ashamed of their bodies, absolutely, you know, um, especially me. But, um, and uh, of course, as rational adults, they can consent. You know, if I was physically uh, disfigured, um, it would be tr you know by birth or by accident. It would be very difficult. It would be, it would be horrific. You know, living in a society where your physical appearance is so important and valued um, aesthetically, you know, it'd be horrible. Um, it'd be really challenging. And God knows what it's like dealing with the attitudes of other people. We're so much worse, perhaps, than the condition itself, you know. Mm -hmm. But in any case, I would definitely volunteer to play a badass demon with, you know, Mer Burgess Meredith as the devil. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> I get to hang out with Burgess Meredith and be like fucking sixth level devil, I'd be like, yeah, 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 let's, you know, and then I'd hope to get loads of other parts playing um, demons, monsters, or or characters that have the condition um, that I have. You know, the physicality is something to be embraced and isn't something to be denied by some middle class do-gooder or any modern day, you know, multicolored haired <laughs> equivalent. You know, should they deny people like that the, their right as an adult to perform as those characters. Um, and Under the Skin, um, the film starring... Scarlett Johansson. Um, we have, a, a, and I'm sorry the name escapes of the chat, we'll put it in the text right now, um, is someone that actually has one of the conditions that one of the characters has at the end sequence of The Sentinel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he plays um, a kind of metaphorical rendition of the Scarlett Johansson character, I think, mm -hmm. um, if, if I interpret that correctly, from Under the Skin, and has since appeared um, in many other films as well, mm -hmm. um, utilising his, his condition as an asset in his... utilising his condition as an asset, you know, for his character in, in, in many other stories. So. To me, that controversy is hypocritical. I don't know if you would agree. I agree with you, particularly on that everyone has the right to consent to do whatever they like, and you shouldn't try and tell them otherwise. Provided that person wants to play a role, they should be allowed to play it, in my opinion. It's one of the, the, the most fundamental freedoms we can give any person in the world, is the right to express themselves creatively and there should be no disincentive to do that just because it offends the moral perspective of anyone. And sometimes that offence is actually 
uh, contradictory ideological offence. Uh, you know, you think they shouldn't because it's exploitation. Yet, well, says you, but not the person who might be having a great time in front of the camera and are getting to live their lives with a freedom they never thought possible. You know, take your agenda and fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> might be the words of advice from actual artists. You know, to these uh, <laughs> would-be politicians that would, you know, tell us what we should watch and who should participate in the art we create. So I guess that, that takes us then. We've talked about the story. Mm -hmm. It was good but uneven, mm. um, but a great roller coaster ride for me um, mm, in the spirit sure. of a haphazard pulp fiction horror paperbacks. Uh, good performances all around. Mm -hmm. Chris Sarandon looked pretty hot. Sure did. And um, I would give The Sentinel a solid eight coconuts out of ten for what it is you know I, I, you want to watch a schlocky satanic crusty paperback um, then eight coconuts mm -hmm. I would like to give seven and a half coconuts but we don't do half coconuts so we I'm gonna have a say half coconut policy eight here. coconuts eight and coconuts. be optimistic and positive so folks I hope you enjoyed our latest episode of Obscurama. Please be sure to share, like and subscribe. And a big thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Thank you and... Goodbye.